Hey, Joel, I want to get a PhD. I need a PhD in order to have capital, right? In order to influence people. I want to have a voice. I want to shape and change future generations. And I think I need a PhD for that. What do you think? What advice would you give me? And more particularly, as a Christian, how could I use a PhD as a Christian to change the culture and influence culture from a Christian perspective using my degree? How should I go about doing that? What advice would you give me? I recently saw a response to questions like this from Samuel Perry. He's a professor at the University of Oklahoma in the Department of Sociology. He's written multiple books. He's an expert on uh, Christians in religion, uh, Christians in society, and specifically, most recently, Christian nationalism. He's a Christian himself, and he often gets asked this question from the perspective of like, hey, I'm a Christian, and I want to have influence you know, on academia, so therefore I need a PhD. So tell me what I should do. How should I go about doing that? Well, his response has so many similarities to the types of responses that I give to students when I sit down and talk to them that I thought I would share his response and reflect and react onto it as a way of kind of talking about how it is that Christians should be trying to influence culture? What should be our approach? That comes out in his response. And I would like to think it would be the type of response I would give as well to a Christian wishing to become a Christian in biology, right? A biology, Christian biology professor. What would that mean? What would that look like? So let's take a look at how he responded to a student just recently when he posted his response on X. All right, so here we are. I'm just taking you to my notes, and uh, this is Samuel Perry's advice for Christians who want to get PhDs. And here's his original post on X. About once a semester, I get an email from a lovely seminary student asking about getting a PhD in sociology as a committed Christian. Often they just want to get a PhD in well, whatever. Yes, I have met many students like that who can't identify a specific interest or thing they're actually interested in. They just simply have this desire to have a PhD, right? Because they feel like it'll help them attain some sort of other goal. Other times they just want to develop a distinctly Christian sociology, right? We need to get, you know, there's this feeling like um, we need to have more Christians in this particular field in order to sway that field in a particular direction and bring a Christian perspective to it. Here's my response this week. And so here's his response. He yeah, it's four separate uh, images. All right, full disclosure here. What I did was I took his JPEGs and I simply uploaded them to ChatGPT 4.0 and asked them to extract the text. And then I checked the text to make sure it reflected what was in the images. But what I'm going to show you is my extracted text because um, it's a little easier to read than looking at those images. Just read what uh, Dr. Perry has to say to this student. And I'll sort of add in some additional uh, comments here. Whether you're a Christian or not, if you're going to pursue a doctorate of philosophy in anything, whether it's be sociology, classics, Hebrew, economics, physics, or in my case, biology, it should be because you are genuinely fascinated by some topic within the broad area of research and want to immerse yourself so fully in it that you're willing to spend the next five-ish years reading every single thing you can by the leading scholars in that area. You got to develop your technical skills to study it, like stats, coding, necessary languages, so forth, and eventually contributing something novel to the global conversation on that subject. That is, after all, what a PhD signifies that you are demonstrably capable of doing original research on that topic. All right, great start. This is pretty much exactly what I would say to a student. You have to be interested in something. You have to have an innate fascination, desire to understand a particular question, right? There's something out there you want to understand that so far hasn't been understood fully. 
right? After all, if you could just read it in a book what the answer to that question was that you have, then you don't need a PhD, right? You have your question answered for you there. You need to be interested in exploring and un uncovering new knowledge, new things about this world, making new observations. And that takes, and since you're going to spend five years doing it, you have to know everything else that everyone else has said on that subject in order for you to know whether you're actually discovering or, or having novel thoughts or making observations that others simply haven't already made. And so that takes a, a lot of energy and effort in itself. You're going to have to care a lot about this question, about this particular topic, about this field of study. You're going to have to care a tremendous amount about it in order to maintain the energy to be able to fully become an expert in that area. So if you just come into a PhD as like, I just want a PhD. I don't really care what it's in. Like, yeah, I'm willing to do the work in order for it not to become drudgery. Because I've seen many students burn out because they weren't really interested in what they were doing. They All they had was this goal in mind of a PhD at the end. It's like, I can put PhD at the end of my name. People listen to me now. They just want this little PhD, right? Those three little letters after their name because they feel like somehow that'll give them more cachet, right? They'll be, they'll be, you know, people look up to them and they'll listen to them, right? And they'll have influence as a result, right? I just need those letters. I don't really care about the work that I did to get here. I just want people to respect like that I, my, my you know the what I've done. All right, let's read on. That is general advice I would give to any buddy who wants to become a graduate student, even a master's student, but especially a PhD student. You've got to be ready to make a real contribution. And that means really becoming an expert, becoming one of the top people in your field. I mean top people in biology. Nobody knows everything about biology. I don't even understand what some of my colleagues do that are biologists. But I do understand specific areas of biology because I devoted an enormous amount of time and effort to understanding a few sub-disciplines in biology. And my perspective, so now he moves on to sort of the, the Christian academic experience. So speaking specifically to somebody who's a Christian is interested in getting this doctorate. And my perspective on Christian academic uh, on a Christian academic is that there's an even higher standard. Not only do we pursue knowledge because we're fascinated by it. Oh, I just think this is really cool, right? That, that can be part of it. You could have a real, you know, I've always liked this, right? I've always been attracted to this thing. I've spent many, you know, I'm always reading about it, learning about this particular topic. That's great. And you need that because you're going to need that to sustain you through the difficult times. But as a Christian, we work at our craft and scholarship with all our hearts and working for the Lord, not simply for men. We're not just doing it for accolades. We're not doing it to have specifically or for the purpose of having like influence or having people like adore you or idolize you or think you're super smart, right? There is a more base level for engaging in this kind of activity, right? Let me be clear about what I mean by that. I don't mean we become sociologists. In my case, I could say biologists, but let's stick with the sociology here because this is a really interesting perspective, especially for sociology. Primarily so we can be missionaries to the vast majority of sociologists who are in fact quite secular. Hey, hey, I need to get a PhD in a particular field so that I can show all those other PhDs in that field how they're wrong, right? I, I'm going to be a missionary to them. And they'll only listen to me if I also have a PhD. Like I'm a kind of equal footing in terms of my, my degrees, right? Many young earth creationists gone out and they've sucked it up and they've gone to a secular college and they've gotten their PhD in order they, so they can come back and now use that, those three letters after their name to give them influence, not usually with other PhDs in their field though, usually with those within the Young Earth Creationist community. Like you're in an equal standing because you've learned the same amount. 
But did they actually earn their PhD because they've truly loved and were interested in that particular topic? Many of them are the type that they just needed that PhD. Right? And this is what I like about what um, Samuel Perry is going to say here um, about the generation of knowledge and the purpose for actually engaging in and learning about the world, about God's creation. I don't mean to become sociologists primarily so we can be missionaries to the vast majority of sociologists who are in fact quite secular. Our primary goal should be to be excellent sociologists. Yeah, well, my primary goal should be in studying biology is to become an excellent biologist. You know, whether or not we in our interpersonal capacity or our research directed con our research directly contributes to edifying Christians or challenging secularism or whatever. We're just called to be excellent. Right? That is, you know, in whatever we do, this isn't just about getting a PhD. This is about our calling in whatever field we might be in. Whatever our work and labor is. Right? Whether we're a high school teacher or a ditch digger. Right? Whether I work at the supermarket or whether I'm working for a big IT firm, right? I should strive to be excellent in what I do. I should be knowledgeable, I should be competent, and I should be a person who holds uh, high ideals for how I interact with other people. I'm a good Christian witness in that way. C.S. Lewis is helpful here. He wrote a brilliant essay called Learning in Wartime, where he, explain, where he was explaining to Oxford students how they could pursue academics when their country is fighting Nazis. Yeah, big question of the time, right? You have friends maybe who are off fighting the Nazis and here you are in academia, sitting in you know, relatively safe rooms and just learning. If our parents have sent us to Oxford and our country allows us to remain there, right? The country has, has said, Yes, you, you, uh, you have another mission, right? To use your gifts to serve your country in another way. There is a prima facie evidence that the life in which we, at any rate, can best lead to the glory of God at present is the learned life. By leading that life to the glory of God, I do not, of course, mean any attempt to make our intellectual inquiries work out to edifying conclusions. That would be, as Bacon says, to offer the author of truth the unclean sacrifice of a lie. I mean the pursuit of knowledge and beauty, in a sense, for their own sake, but in a sense which does not exclude their being for God's sake. An appetite for these things exists in the human mind, and God makes no appetite in vain. We can therefore pursue knowledge as such and beauty as such in the sure confidence by so doing so we're either advancing to the vision of God ourselves or indirectly helping others to do so. Right? And what St. Barry says here is catch a few things here. God gives us appetites for knowledge and beauty and it's good to pursue them. There's nothing wrong with pursuing beauty, like pursuing art, pursuing knowledge. The living and living the learned life for the glory of God does not involve making sure everything we ever write or teach somehow reaches edifying conclusions. Not everything we have to do is a great novel or a piece of work that's going to live forever. Because God isn't glorified by our lies on his behalf. He's glorified when we develop our God-given capacities to their fullest, consistent with his calling on our lives. Whatever it is you're doing, whether it's the, the simplest task, whether it's writing the simplest type of text, right? Making the simplest form of art. If you're doing it for the glory of God, you're doing it in the correct spirit. Let me give you another Lewis quote. This is from a letter to an inspiring Christian writer who apparently thought it was a Christian writer's duty to somehow cram explicitly biblical or gospel sounding bits into everything that they wrote. Lewis corrects them here. And I think this is a very important message for all Christians. I think you have a mistaken idea of a Christian writer's duty. Work whose Christianity is latent may do quite as much good and may reach some who the more religious work would scare away. The first business of a story is to be a good story. <laughs> it's like, 
when our Lord made a wheel in the carpenter shop, what was the most important thing about the wheel? Well, it was first and foremost a good wheel. He would have done a good job making that wheel. Don't try to bring in specifically Christian bits. If God wants you to serve him in that way, and he might not, there are different vocations. You'll find it coming in on your own accord. If not, well, hey, a good story, which will give innocent pleasure in itself is a good thing. Just like cooking a nourishing meal. I love the I love this this idea here. Like, you know, Lewis is saying, you don't put little Christian bits into family soup. And yet it's a necessary task to cook the food for a family. That is an honorable duty. That is a good thing. In other words, Lewis argues that the primary duty of the Christian, the writer, the carpenter, the sociologist, the biologist, isn't that we make sure explicitly Christian bits are sprinkled into everything. It's first and foremost to be excellent at what they do. Right? I think was, I should be excellent at what I do as a biologist. That in itself is one of my primary goals and the primary missions. So here's my advice to you on whether you should pursue a PhD in sociology. Don't do it. <laughs> From your email, at least. It kind of sounds like you want to be a pastor with a PhD in whatever. And as I said, I've talked to students who've talked to me about wanting to get a PhD. And the first thing I ask them is, well, what exactly do you want to do? Like, what, what do you want to learn? Well, it doesn't matter. You tell me like what I could study. It's almost like, give me a project. Give me a project and I'll work really hard and I'll collect the data and I'll write it up and then you can give me my PhD because that's what I want. They're not thinking about the process. They're not thinking about the contribution of their from their efforts, right? And here, likewise, you know, these are people who are like, I want a PhD, just, you know, find me a way to get one. That's a common feeling in seminary. I think that's unnecessary, but I'd rather you pursue a PhD in counseling, so much more relevant to what you have going on in your ministry. New Testament historical theology, right? Popular with the Reformed folks, right? I, I, I certainly uh, can, can relate to that. Or some sort of online doctoral program in maybe leadership at Liberty University or whatever. Pursuing a PhD in sociology when you really don't care to pursue the learned life in other words, you're not willing to really put in the five years of learning the ins and outs of theory in sociology, all right, is not only a waste of your time, but will likely be a bad witness. And that, to me, is a really important thing he's saying here. You'll end up being, instead of a positive witness for Christ, you could very well end up being a bad witness. Because if your goal is simply to get that PhD to show that everyone else in that field is wrong, well, you're likely going to come off, all right, as somebody who isn't actually a learned person, right? You look like somebody who just has an agenda, who doesn't listen, right? I'm not here to listen, understand, but if you become the best sociologist you can be, right, and that leads you to discovering new ways of thinking through social, uh, you know, theory, that challenge the current theory, then that's fine. But if you're just going to sprinkle it with, like, I am specifically saying that I'm going to make a Christian sociology, and you're going in with that attitude, right? you likely are not going to end up actually with a very good understanding of sociology. I'd rather you be a Christian who has a selective appreciation for some things sociologists write than be a Christian who's a crappy dilettante who knows just enough sociology to be arrogant. <laughs> and I know some people in science, right, who've gotten degrees, PhDs in various fields of science, who really don't know the science very well. But because they have the PhD, they're extremely arrogant about it, right? They feel like they can tell everyone else, everyone else you know, what they should believe about X, Y, and Z. And then you get into like the whole like, you know, Christians who have specifically gotten PhDs in a discipline, uh, scientific discipline, in order to try to 
overthrow the the conventional ideas of the day but they prove many times prove that they don't even understand those conventional ideas because why because they didn't really truly devote themselves to trying to understand those theories um from the get-go because they entered into from a, an adversarial perspective not trying to like fully understand and be the best biologist to give the best hearing of what academics think of that particular you know, of, the, of that particular evidence um in other words, they come in with closed ears and therefore unable to learn what they really need to be able to learn to truly interact in a way that would not lead them to being uh you know perceived as being arrogant but to be respected even when they just even when somebody disagrees the world doesn't need christians learning sociology so they can fight and or convert secular sociologists it needs Christians who are among the best sociologists in the world. Now, look at who's speaking here. Matthew Perry. Written over a hundred articles, right? Peer-reviewed articles. He advanced extremely quickly through the University of Oklahoma system from assistant professor to associate professor to full professor in about the fastest possible way you can. One of the most respected sociologists in the country in several different areas, right? And he's a Christian, right? So, and he's respected as somebody who, I mean, there are doubtless many sociologists who disagree with some of his views. I'm sure, I've, I've looked at some of his views. I know that some sociologists and some, uh, you know, that secular um, professors would disagree with him, but you have to respect his body of work. You know that he understands the issues, that he's done the research, that he's done the voluminous amount of reading necessary to capture uh, and at least have interacted and respected the, th the, the, the ideas he may be disagreeing with. If your goals are anything less than that, I'd prefer you pursue something more directly relevant to what you do want to do with excellence. So his final message is, look, you got to find something that you want to do and you want to do it in an excellent way because that is the community of Christians that would be tra will transform the world. If they all are doing things that they truly are trying to do in an excellent fashion. All right. Um, yeah, I just, I just had to share this with you because I've run into many many students who have no sense of direction they simply have a goal no idea how to get there um and with some of them it's like you can help them understand how to get there but the how to get there is you need to find that thing that you're passionate about you kind of have to be passionate about a subject and you have to want to do it well, right? So the process that you go through has to be done well. There's no cutting corners. There's no cheating along the way. All right, that's it. I just wanted to share this response by Samuel Perry because I thought it was, I thought it was really excellent advice. Um, certainly excellent advice to those coming out of seminary who want to be that, you know, um, pastor that has a PhD, right? And so they're just, they're looking around for like, what can I get a PhD in? And then, oh, uh, sociology. I mean, that's a, that's a field uh, ripe with, uh, with, with need, right? For Christian influence. And so if I could just find a way to get a, a sociology PhD, um, I'd be able to, you know, write some books and write some papers and be a speaker on that on the side you know, do some conference talks and so forth. And I was you're kind of thinking about like, here's these outputs. I'm not saying that those things are necessarily wrong. I have known pastors who have taken this route, right? They've gone to seminary and then eventually they've ended up going and getting a graduate degree. They've gotten that PhD. But all of them, all the ones I know of that have done that had a specific topic a specific thing that was always a strong driver for them, a question, a burning question that they, they wanted to pursue and understand better.
Uh, and as a result of them doing that and becoming an expert in that particular field, they've contributed all right, to the knowledge in that area and they continue to contribute in that area. But a PhD just for PhD's sake is, is not a worthy goal in itself. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening. Talk to you later.